Fables Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos is brought to you by FoundItemClothing.com. Check out their Cthulhu slippers and cool cult film t-shirts. Edited and produced by D.B. Spitzer. Featuring Sarah Fee and D.B. Spitzer. Music by Kevin McLeod. PGTTCM is part of the Dark Mists Network. Check out all the cool podcasts that we like at darkmyths.org. Subscribe where you subscribe. Like where you like. Rate where you rate. We recommend podbean.com and Apple Podcasts as well. Find PGTTCM on social media at PGTTCM and on YouTube at People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. If you want to donate, go to the Patreon button on pgttcm.podbean.com or paypal.me slash pgttcm. All donations receive an on-air congratulations. Shop at pgttcm.threadless.com or pgttcm.com at the shop. PGTTCM is an exploration of the Cthulhu Mythos, Weird fiction, the gothic literary tradition, classic sci-fi, fantasy, and horror. Thank you. On with the show. Recorded by Nicole Doolin on the web at NicoleDoolin.com The Turn of the Screw by Henry James Preface The story had held us round the fire sufficiently breathless, but except the obvious remark that it was gruesome, as, on Christmas Eve, in an old house, a strange tale should essentially be. I remember no comment uttered, till somebody happened to say that it was the only case he had met in which such a visitation had fallen on a child. The case, I may mention, was that of an apparition, in just such an old house as had gathered us for the occasion, an appearance of a dreadful kind, to a little boy sleeping in the room with his mother and waking her up in the terror of it, waking her not to dissipate his dread and soothe him to sleep again, but to encounter also herself, before she had succeeded in doing so, the same sight that had shaken him. It was this observation that drew from Douglas, not immediately, but later in the evening, a reply that had the interesting consequence to which I call attention. Someone else told a story not particularly effective, which I saw he was not following. This I took for a sign that he had himself something to produce, and that we should only have to wait. We waited, in fact, till two nights later, but that same evening, before we scattered, he brought out what was in his mind. I quite agree, in regard to Griffin's ghost, or whatever it was, that it's appearing first to the little boy, at so tender an age, adds a particular touch. But it's not the first occurrence of its charming kind that I know to have involved a child. If the child gives the effect another turn of the screw, what do you say to two children? We say, of course, somebody exclaimed, that they give two turns. Also that we want to hear about them. I can see Douglas there before the fire, to which he had got up to present his back, looking down at his interlocutor with his hands in his pockets. Nobody but me till now has ever heard it's quite too horrible. This naturally was declared by several voices to give the thing the utmost price. And our friend, with quiet art, prepared his triumph by turning his eyes over the rest of us and going on. It's beyond everything. Nothing at all that I know touches it. For sheer terror, I remember asking. He seemed to say it was not so simple as that. To be really at a loss how to qualify it. He passed his hand over his eyes made a little wincing grimace for dreadful dreadfulness. Oh, how delicious, cried one of the women. He took no notice of her. He looked at me, but as if, instead of me, he saw what he spoke of, for general uncanny ugliness and horror and pain. Well then, I said, just sit right down and begin. He turned round to the fire, gave a kick to a log, watched it an instant, then as he faced us again, I can't begin. I shall have to send to town. There was a unanimous groan at this, and much reproach, after which, in his preoccupied way, he explained, The story's written. It's in a locked drawer. It has not been out for years. 
I could write to my man and enclose the key. He could send down the packet as he finds it. It was to me in particular that he appeared to propound this, appeared almost to appeal for aid not to hesitate. He had broken a thickness of ice, the formation of many a winter, had had his reasons for a long silence. The others resented postponement, but it was just his scruples that charmed me. I adjured him to write by the first post, and to agree with us for an early hearing. Then I asked him if the experience in question had been his own. To this his answer was prompt. Oh, thank God, no. And is the record yours? You took the thing down? Nothing but the impression. I took that here. He tapped his heart. I've never lost it. Then your manuscript is in old, faded ink, and in the most beautiful hand. He hung fire again, a woman's. She has been dead these twenty years. She sent me the pages in question before she died. They were all listening now, and of course there was somebody to be arch, or at any rate to draw the inference. But if he put the inference by without a smile, it was also without irritation. She was a most charming person, but she was ten years older than I. She was my sister's governess, he quietly said. She was the most agreeable woman I've ever known in her position. She would have been worthy of any whatever. It was long ago, and this episode was long before. It was a trinity, and I found her at home on my coming down the second summer. I was much there that year. It was a beautiful one. And we had, in her off hours, some strolls and talks in the garden. Talks in which she struck me as awfully clever and nice. Oh yes, don't grin. I liked her extremely, and am glad to this day to think she liked me too. If she hadn't, she wouldn't have told me. She had never told anyone. It wasn't simply that she said so, but that I knew she hadn't. I was sure. I could see. You'll easily judge why when you hear. Because the thing had been such a scare? He continued to fix me. You'll easily judge, he repeated. You will. I fixed him too. I see. She was in love. He laughed for the first time. You are acute. Yes, she was in love. That is, she had been. That came out. She couldn't tell a story without its coming out. I saw it. And she saw I saw it. But neither of us spoke of it. I remember the time and the place. The corner of the lawn. The shade of the great beaches in the long, hot summer afternoon. It wasn't a scene for a shudder. But oh. He quitted the fire and dropped back into his chair. You'll receive the packet Thursday morning, I inquired. Probably not till the second post. Well then, after dinner, you'll all meet me here? He looked at us round again. Isn't anybody going? It was almost the tone of hope. Everybody will stay. I will, and I will, cried the ladies whose departure had been fixed. Mrs. Griffin, however, expressed the need for a little more light. Who was it she was in love with? The story will tell, I took upon myself to reply. Oh, I can't wait for the story. The story won't tell, said Douglas. Not in any literal, vulgar way. More's the pity, then. That's the only way I ever understand. Won't you tell, Douglas? Somebody else inquired. He sprang to his feet again. Yes, tomorrow. Now I must go to bed. Good night. And quickly catching up a candlestick, he left us slightly bewildered. From our end of the great brown hall, we heard his step on the stair whereupon Mrs. Griffin spoke. Well, if I don't know who she was in love with, I know who he was. She was ten years older, said her husband. Raison de plus at that age. But it's rather nice, his long reticence. Forty years, Griffin put in, with this outbreak at last. The outbreak, I returned, will make a tremendous occasion of Thursday night and everyone so agreed with me that in the light of it we lost all attention for everything else. The last story, however incomplete and like the mere opening of a serial, had been told. We hand-shook and candle-stuck, as somebody said, and went to bed. I knew the next day that a letter containing the key had, by the first post, gone off to his London apartments. But in spite of, or perhaps just on account of, the eventual diffusion of this knowledge, we quite left him alone till after dinner, till such an hour of the evening, in fact, as might best accord with the kind of emotion on which our hopes were fixed. 
Then he became as communicative as we could desire, and indeed gave us his best reason for being so. We had it from him again before the fire in the hall, as we had had our mild wonders of the previous night. It appeared that the narrative he had promised to read us really required for a proper intelligence a few words of prologue. Let me say here distinctly to have done with it that this narrative, from an exact transcript of my own made much later, is what I shall presently give. Poor Douglas, before his death, when it was in sight, committed to me the manuscript that reached him on the third of these days, and that, on the same spot, with immense effect, he began to read to our hushed little circle on the night of the fourth. The departing ladies who had said they would stay didn't, of course, thank heaven, stay. They departed in consequence of arrangements made. In a rage of curiosity, as they professed, produced by the touches with which he had already worked us up. But that only made his little final auditory more compact and select, kept it round the hearth, subject to a common thrill. The first of these touches conveyed that the written statement took up the tale at a point after it had, in a manner, begun. The fact to be in possession of was therefore that his old friend, the youngest of several daughters of a poor country parson, had, at the age of twenty, on taking service for the first time in the schoolroom, come up to London, in trepidation, to answer in person an advertisement that had already placed her in brief correspondence with the advertiser. This person proved on her presenting herself, for judgment, at a house in Harley Street, that impressed her as vast and imposing. This prospective patron proved a gentleman, a bachelor in the prime of life, such a figure as had never risen, save in a dream or an old novel, before a fluttered, anxious girl out of a Hampshire vicarage. One could easily fix his type. It never happily dies out. He was handsome and bold and pleasant, offhand and gay and kind. He struck her inevitably as gallant and splendid. But what took her most of all, and gave her the courage she afterward showed, was that he put the whole thing to her as a kind of favor, an obligation he should gratefully incur. She conceived him as rich, but as fearfully extravagant. Saw him all in a glow of high fashion, of good looks, of expensive habits, of charming ways with women. He had for his own town residence a big house filled with the spoils of travel and the trophies of the chase. But it was to his country home, an old family place in Essex, that he wished her immediately to proceed. He had been left by the death of their parents in India. Guardian to a small nephew and a small niece, children of a younger, a military brother, whom he had lost two years before. These children were, by the strangest of chances for a man in his position, a lone man without the right sort of experience or a grain of patience, very heavily on his hands. It had all been a great worry, and on his own part, doubtless, a series of blunders. But he immensely pitied the poor chicks, and had done all he could. Had in particular sent them down to his other house, the proper place for them being, of course, the country, and kept them there from the first, with the best people he could find to look after them, parting even with his own servants to wait on them and going down himself, whenever he might, to see how they were doing. The awkward thing was that they had practically no other relations, and that his own affairs took up all his time. He had put them in possession of Bly. Which was healthy and secure, and had placed at the head of their little establishment, but below stairs only, an excellent woman, Mrs. Gross, whom he was sure his visitor would like, and who had formerly been maid to his mother. She was now housekeeper, and was also acting for the time as superintendent to the little girl, of whom, without children of her own, she was by good luck extremely fond. There were plenty of people to help. But of course, the young lady who should go down as governess would be in supreme authority. She would also have, in holidays, to look after the small boy, who had been for a term at school, young as he was to be sent. But what else could be done? And who, as the holidays were about to begin, would be back from one day to the other? 
There had been for the two children at first a young lady whom they had had the misfortune to lose. She had done for them quite beautifully. She was a most respectable person till her death, the great awkwardness of which had precisely left no alternative but the school for little Miles. Mrs. Gross, since then, in the way of manners and things, had done as she could for Flora. And there were further a cook, a housemaid, a dairy woman, an old pony, an old groom, and an old gardener, all likewise thoroughly respectable. So far had Douglas presented his picture, when someone put a question, and what did the former governess die of, of so much respectability? Our friend's answer was prompt. That will come out. I don't anticipate. Excuse me. I thought that was just what you are doing. In her successor's place, I suggested, I should have wished to learn if the office brought with it necessary danger to life. Douglas completed my thought. She did wish to learn, and she did learn. You shall hear tomorrow what she learned. Meanwhile, of course, the prospect struck her as slightly grim. She was young, untried, nervous. It was a vision of serious duties and little company, of really great loneliness. She hesitated, took a couple of days to consult and consider, but the salary offered much exceeded her modest measure, and on a second interview she faced the music. She engaged, and Douglas, with this, made a pause that, for the benefit of the company, moved me to throw in. The moral of which was, of course, the seduction exercised by the splendid young man. She succumbed to it. He got up as he had done the night before, went to the fire, gave a stir to a log with his foot, then stood a moment with his back to us. She saw him only twice. Yes, but that's just the beauty of her passion. A little to my surprise, on this, Douglas turned round to me. It was the beauty of it. There were others. He went on. Who hadn't succumbed? He told her frankly all his difficulty that for several applicants the conditions had been prohibitive. They were somehow simply afraid. It sounded dull, but sounded strange, and all the more so because of his main condition, which was that she should never trouble him, but never, never, neither appeal nor complain, nor write about anything. Only meet all questions herself, receive all monies from his solicitor, take the whole thing over and let him alone. She promised to do this, and she mentioned to me that when, for a moment, disburdened, delighted, he held her hand, thanking her for the sacrifice, she already felt rewarded. But was that all her reward? One of the ladies asked. She never saw him again. Oh," said the lady, which, as our friend immediately left us again, was the only other word of importance contributed to the subject till the next night. By the corner of the hearth, in the best chair, he opened the faded red cover of a thin, old-fashioned gilt-edged album. The whole thing took indeed more nights than one, but on the first occasion, the same lady put another question: "What is your title?" "I haven't one." "Oh, I have." I said, but Douglas, without heeding me, had begun to read with a fine clearness that was like a rendering to the ear of the beauty of his author's hand. The Turn of the Screw, by Henry James, Chapter One. I remember the whole beginning as a succession of flights and drops, a little seesaw of the right throbs and the wrong. After rising in town to meet his appeal, I had at all events a couple of very bad days. Found myself doubtful again, and felt indeed sure I had made a mistake. In this state of mind, I spent the long hours of bumping, swinging coach, that carried me to the stopping place at which I was to be met by a vehicle from the house. This convenience, I was told, had been ordered, and I found, toward the close of the June afternoon, a commodious fly in waiting for me, driving at that hour on a lovely day. Through a country to which the summer sweetness seemed to offer me a friendly welcome, my fortitude mounted afresh, and as we turned into the avenue, encountered a reprieve that was probably but a proof of the point to which it had sunk. I suppose I had expected or had dreaded something so melancholy, 
but what greeted me was a good surprise. I remember as a most pleasant impression the broad, clear front, its open windows and fresh curtains, and the pair of maids looking out. I remember the lawn, and the bright flowers, and the crunch of my wheels on the gravel, and the clustered treetops over which the rook circled and cawed in the golden sky. The scene had a greatness that made it a different affair from my own scant home, and there immediately appeared at the door, with a little girl in her hand, a civil person who dropped me as decent a curtsy as if I had been the mistress or a distinguished visitor. I had received in Harley Street a narrower notion of the place, and that, as I recalled it, made me think the proprietor still more of a gentleman, suggested that what I was to enjoy might be something beyond his promise. I had no drop again till the next day, for I was carried triumphantly through the following hours by my introduction to the younger of my pupils. The little girl who accompanied Mrs. Gross appeared to me on the spot a creature so charming as to make it a great fortune to have to do with her. She was the most beautiful child I had ever seen, and I afterward wondered that my employer had not told me more of her. I slept little that night. I was too much excited. And this astonished me, too, I recollect. Remained with me, adding to my sense of the liberality with which I was treated. The large, impressive room. One of the best in the house. The great state bed, as I almost felt it. The full figure draperies, the long glasses in which, for the first time, I could see myself from head to foot, all struck me like the extraordinary charm of my small charge, as so many things thrown in. It was thrown in as well from the first moment that I should get on with Mrs. Gross, in a relation over which, on my way in the coach, I fear I had rather brooded. The only thing, indeed, that in this early outlook might have made me shrink again was the clear circumstance of her being so glad to see me. I perceived within half an hour that she was so glad, stout, simple, plain, clean, wholesome woman, as to be positively on her guard against showing it too much. I wondered even then a little why she should wish not to show it, and that, with reflection, with suspicion, might of course have made me uneasy. But it was a comfort that there could be no uneasiness in a connection with anything so beatific as the radiant image of my little girl, the vision of whose angelic beauty had probably more than anything else to do with the restlessness that, before morning, made me several times rise and wander about my room, to take in the whole picture and prospect, to watch from my open window the faint summer dawn, to look at such portions of the rest of the house as I could catch, and to listen, while in the fading dusk the first birds began to twitter for the possible recurrence of a sound or two, less natural and not without, but within, than I had fancied I heard. There had been a moment when I believed I recognized, faint and far, the cry of a child. There had been another when I found myself just consciously starting as at the passage before my door of a light footstep. But these fancies were not marked enough to be thrown off. And it is only in the light, or the gloom, I should rather say, of other and subsequent matters that they now come back to me. To watch, teach, form, little Flora, would too evidently be the making of a happy and useful life. It had been agreed between us downstairs that, after this first occasion, I should have her as a matter of course at night, her small white bed being already arranged to that end in my room. What I had undertaken was the whole care of her, and she had remained, just this last time, with Mrs. Gross, only as an effect of our consideration for my inevitable strangeness and her natural timidity. In spite of this timidity, which the child herself, in the oddest way in the world, had been perfectly frank and brave about, allowing it, without a sign of uncomfortable consciousness, with the deep, 
sweet serenity indeed of one of Raphael's holy infants to be discussed, to be imputed to her, and to determine us. I feel quite sure she would presently like me. It was part of what I already liked Mrs. Gross herself for, the pleasure I could see her feel in my admiration and wonder as I sat at supper with four tall candles and with my pupil, in a high chair and a bib, brightly facing me, between them, over bread and milk. There were naturally things that in Flora's presence could pass between us only as prodigious and gratified looks, obscure and roundabout illusions. And the little boy? Does he look like her? Is he too so very remarkable? One wouldn't flatter a child. Oh, miss, most remarkable. If you think well of this one, and she stood there with a plate in her hand, beaming at our companion, who looked from one of us to the other with placid, heavenly eyes that contained nothing to check us. Yes, if I do, you will be carried away by the little gentleman. That, I think, is what I came for. To be carried away, I am afraid, however, I remember feeling the impulse to add, I am rather easily carried away. I was carried away in London. I can still see Mrs. Gross's broad face as she took this in. In Harley Street? In Harley Street. Well, miss, you're not the first. And you won't be the last. Oh, I've no pretension, I could laugh, to being the only one. My other pupil, at any rate, as I understand, comes back tomorrow. Not tomorrow. Friday, miss. He arrives, as you did, by the coach under care of the guard and is to be met by the same carriage. I forthwith expressed that the proper, as well as the pleasant and friendly thing, would be therefore that on the arrival of the public conveyance, I should be in waiting for him with his little sister, an idea in which Mrs. Gross concurred so heartily that I somehow took her manner as a kind of comforting pledge, never falsified, thank heaven, that we should on every question be quite at one. Oh, she was glad I was there. What I felt the next day was, I suppose, nothing that could be fairly called a reaction from the cheer of my arrival. It was probably, at the most, only a slight oppression produced by a fuller measure of the scale. As I walked round them, gazed up at them, took them in, of my new circumstances, they had, as it were, an extent and mass for which I had not been prepared and in the presence of which I found myself, freshly, a little scared as well as a little proud. Lessons in this agitation certainly suffered some delay. I reflected that my first duty was, by the gentlest arts I could contrive, to win the child into the sense of knowing me. I spent the day with her out of doors. I arranged with her, to her great satisfaction, that it should be she, she only, who might show me the place. She showed it step by step, and room by room, and secret by secret, with droll, delightful, childish talk about it, and with the result, in half an hour, of our becoming immense friends. Young as she was, I was struck throughout our little tour, with her confidence and courage with the way, in empty chambers and dull corridors, on crooked staircases that made me pause, and even on the summit of an old machicolated square tower that made me dizzy. Her morning music, her disposition to tell me so many more things than she asked, rang out and led me on. I have not seen Bly since the day I left it, and I dare say that to my older and more informed eyes it would now appear sufficiently contracted. But as my little conductress, with her hair of gold and her frock of blue, danced before me round corners and pattered down passages. I had the view of a castle of romance, inhabited by a rosy sprite, such a place as would somehow, for diversion of the young idea, take all color out of storybooks and fairy tales. Wasn't it just a storybook over which I had fallen a doze and a dream? No, it was a big, ugly, antique, but convenient house, embodying a few features of a building still older, half-replaced and half-utilized, in which I had the fancy of our being almost as lost as a handful of passengers in a great 
drifting ship. Well, I was strangely at the helm. End of chapter one. Recorded by Nicole Doolan on the web at nicoledoolan.com.